welcome to the product leader series here at Product Manager HQ. I'm very, very, very excited to have Matt LeMay. Matt is an internationally recognized product leader, author, and speaker. He's currently co-founder and partner at the consultancy company Sudden Campus. He built and scaled product management practices at companies from startups to Fortune 500 companies. He was an adjunct adjunct professor at NYU, and he taught product management principles at General Assembly for many years. Here to discuss his latest book, Product Management in Practice, uh, today to answer your questions. So feel free to type all your questions you have for Matt in the chat box. He's giving away three books to those who are um, engaging with us. So welcome, Matt. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Hello. Hi. So let's start before we discuss your book and uh, with how your journey into product management was. Can you sure. let us know? Yeah. So the, the short answer is accidental. Um, I got into product management um, in 2010. So it's been 12 years now. I was um, working, doing marketing for a music nonprofit. And my background was in music and music writing. Uh, I also happened to know how to write code back when uh, one would be a, I'm trying to think what the term was. It wasn't web developer. It was something like a website designer is what I probably called myself. Um, slinging some PHP and some MySQL and still using tables instead of CSS. So I was not very good at what I did. Uh, but I loved the the people part of it. Um, the same thing had been true when I was a musician. I wrote about music. I, I loved bringing different ideas and pieces and expertise together to create something. So I was lucky enough to meet somebody who worked at uh, Betaworks, which was the parent company of Bitly in New York. And he kind of said, go to this company and figure out something to do. So my first title was API evangelist. I was sort of doing a... Uh, developer relations role. And then I, uh, if I recall correctly, I did a Google search for a job in tech, bad at code, salary okay. And the words product manager came back and I was like, I'm a product manager now. So I showed up and I was like, I am a product manager and spent the next three years uh, trying to figure out what exactly I had signed up for. Gary, so how did you learn? Um, so you have this book out, uh, Product Management in Practice, and I love it. I love how Thank you go you. Uh, everything and tie it together. Because when you learn the frameworks, you just learn the frameworks. But your book really paints the picture of what product management what is. So you didn't have that before. How no. Did you um, yeah, I mean, I the first couple of years I was working as a product manager, I just thought I must be really bad at it because I had read that I was supposed to be a visionary and I was supposed to be the mini CEO and I was supposed to own the roadmap. And I just showed up every day and talked to people. And I kept thinking, what am I missing? What's, when is this gonna, is it the company that's doing this wrong? Am I doing it wrong? What's, when is this all gonna fall into place? And then years later, I started talking to more product managers. Back in 2010, there weren't communities like this. There wasn't the PMHQ community. There wasn't the Mind the Product community. Everyone was kind of trying to figure this out on their own. And then I started talking to other product managers. And a lot of us were going through this, a similar thing where we had read the existing literature and it just didn't line up with the realities of our day-to-day -day work. And many of us took that on as a personal failure. Um, so it became really important to me to start writing about this and to share my experience in the hopes that it resonated with somebody else. And still to this day, I'm still ready to uh, you know, jump in and say, nope, you're wrong. You're just missing this one thing. And actually you are supposed to be the visionary CEO of the product. I still, like, I still have that voice in the back of my head saying, maybe you're still doing this wrong. But the more I get a chance to talk with other product managers and coach product managers and, and lead product managers and learn from product managers, the more, the more I'm like, maybe I was onto something there. Yeah. Um, you start off your book with asking this one question, 
Um, what is one story from your work that you wish someone had told you on your, the first day as a product manager? Yes, uh, I love asking that question. And uh, I certainly have my own answer, which uh, is in the book, but I, it's kind of woven into one of the chapters, which is at one point when I was leading product for a small company, our, I, I had spent a lot of time trying to get everybody in a leadership position bought on to a new roadmap. It was a practical roadmap. It was a roadmap driven by compromise and constraint in a positive way. And it was a roadmap that I think would have really moved us in the right direction from a business model standpoint. The CEO of this company told me, you're so creative, you're a creative person, go come back next week with your creative version of the roadmap. And I took that as permission to throw away everything everyone else had signed up for. Um, and I assumed I would have air cover to come back and just do whatever I wanted. Um, this was very much not the case as I found out in a very difficult meeting, but it was a really important reminder for me that, um, you know, you, you're not in charge even when somebody tells you you're in charge, that your work is always gonna be more resilient and more impactful when you work through people rather than around people. And when you let other people in the organization, not just inform, but also advocate for the path you're taking forward. So I, you know, that was one of many experiences in my career where for years I was really upset. And I was like, that person was a, d didn't, didn't do a good job and they, they wronged me in some way. And then years later I could look back on it and say, oh, okay, but I also have a lot of responsibility in that situation. Um, and I, I hope that as I've gotten a little older and maybe wiser, that those those cycles have gotten shorter so I can learn from these things more quickly and sometimes even before I make the mistake, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. And there is this principle of core, the core principle, mm -hmm. um, which I love as well in your book. Um, and for those who haven't gotten it, I definitely recommend it, especially if you're new to product management or even if you have some experience, it really ties in so many things um, in practice, product management in practice, but it gives you a very, very good picture of what um, all the curveballs in product management uh, will throw you. So can you talk a little bit about the core? Um, yes, yeah, so, so core stands for communication, organization, research, and execution. And those are really just the four things that I've seen product managers uh, utilize to their great benefit, let's say. Um, you know, a lot of organizations I work with that try to operationalize that model, change it around. Some change it to, to score, to add strategy. Um, you know, it's as with all as with all models and frameworks, it is variably useful depending on where you are. But when I was developing the core model, I would ask product managers, working product managers, to rank their own skills from you know, most prevalent to least prevalent. And I got a lot of different orders from people, which suggested to me that it was at least something useful as a way to kind of think about and evaluate your own path through product management. I also, you know, a lot of things that are presented as skills for product managers, I think, are actually activities. So like, what does road mapping mean as a skill? What does story writing mean as a skill? These are sort of context specific articulations of other skills. So one of the things I believe in really strongly is that product managers, successful product managers are always adaptable and are always looking for new ways to learn and grow. And you know, I've worked with product managers who've never written a user story before but they're open to learning and they try and they say, does this work? Does this work? Does this work? No, yes. And they learn really quickly. Whereas I've worked with product managers who are much more experienced in road mapping and in user story writing, who are so entrenched in one way of doing things that they can't actually grow into the type of product manager that their organization needs in that particular moment. So I, you know, I think that there are ways in which being new to things that beginner's mind can actually be really beneficial for product managers if they're open to that being beneficial um, because there's no sense of any one way being the right way to do things. And the sooner you can recognize that there is no one right way to do things and you really are gonna have to do what works in your particular context for your particular product, your particular team, uh, then I think that there's a, a, 
a freedom and an openness that can come with that, which are, which almost make this role fun again for me anyhow. Yeah, yeah. And your chapter on that and growth um, gives a lot of uh, tips and strategies and paints more of a picture of like what to do, what not to do. So um, I think that so far is one of my um, favorite chap chapters in your book. Um, what can I ask you, what is your favorite chapter? I'm sure it, all of it, everything, but which one was fun, fun for you to write? Which chapter? Sure. So in this, the, the edition that just came out is the second edition of the book. Um, and I rewrote a lot of things and added a lot of chapters. Um, the one I'm proudest of is a new chapter. I believe I have the book right here. What did I say? Um, it is called uh, Vision, Mission, Objectives, Strategy, and Other Fancy Words. Um, I added this because I've seen a lot of product managers get into very heated debates about what is really a vision, what is really a strategy, what are really objectives, these kind of heated semantic debates. Um, and I kept trying to have the right answer to those heated semantic debates until I eventually gave up. And I was like, look, at a high level, you just need to know like where you're going and how you're getting there. And you can define those things however you want. Um, it's been interesting for me in a consulting capacity working with companies where most up to three leaders will say, the problem is we don't have a product strategy. But then when I ask each of them what a product strategy is, they give me a completely different answer. Um, you know, I think there is a tendency in product management, given how ambiguous and challenging this work is, people really cling to the definitive answers they have. And when you have a definition, when you read an article that says this is what something is supposed to be, it's very tempting to just hold on to that really tightly and say, well, so long as I'm doing this right, I'm doing this job well. So it was a joy for me to go back through some of these topics of, you know, strategy and, and objectives and, and metrics and things that, that feel very uh, fixed in product management world and to maybe even loosen them up a little bit and say, look, these things are all gonna be defined differently. The question is, can it help you make better decisions? And if it can, then you're probably doing something well. And if it can't, then it doesn't matter whether you're going by the definition you read about in a book or a medium post. It's probably, if it's not helping you make decisions, then it's not helping you do your job. Yeah, uh, and that's very important also for somebody who's starting out to understand. And I really think that your book helps um, individuals to just make sure that that is um, that's the focus is to really see what's at, what you're presented with. I want to remind the audience uh, to feel free to ask uh, any question in the chat, um, and we do have that uh, giveaway. So there's a yeah. giveaway. For if you if you are capable, I, I would love to answer your questions. Um, yes, and thank you to everyone who's here. I, I'm like I can't see you, but I know you're there. I'm, I'm, happy to, I'm very happy that you've taken the time. I appreciate it, and I appreciate it too. So thank you for your uh, time as well to come on here and discuss your chap uh, your book. Um, what inspired you to write the book, the initial version and the current version? Sure. So the initial version, I had a conversation with somebody and I said, I'm thinking about writing a product management book. And they said, what's it going to be? And I kind of, I, I kind of kept circling around. I couldn't figure out what the book was going to be. And he said, it sounds like you just want to write a book where you dump everything you think would be useful for a product manager. And you can't do that. Like you have to have a, a point of view, you have to hold something back. And I, I remember thinking like, I don't, that's exactly what the book is going to be. I'm just going to dump everything I think would be useful to a product manager into a book. And once that clicked for me, I flew, I wrote the first edition so quickly because any, like anything that I thought would be useful, anything somebody had told me that I could share forward, anything I had learned, anything other people could share. I was just like, this work is so challenging. Anything that'll be useful, I'm just gonna throw it in there. And I think part of the reason I wanted to write the second edition was that A, I had learned a lot more things in the last five years. I was like, right, well, I have a lot of new things to share. And also the world I was sharing into had changed a lot. Um, you know, the way we do product management in 2022 is very different from the way we did product manager management in 2017, both because we're working in more remote and hybrid contexts. And I think because just the, you know, there's more information out there. There's more 
more product management community, more product management discourse. There's more, more stuff out there. So it was really important for me to, as soon as I felt kind of that I had hit that inflection point where I thought it would be valuable enough that people who had read the first edition would also get a book's worth of value out of a second edition, um, it was really important for me to move it forward. Yeah, uh, one more question for me and I'm gonna take a question from the audience member. Um, can you tell me more about who the book is for uh, in general? It's for anybody, I'd say anybody working on a product team. I've heard, I've had a lot of really positive feedback from engineers and from designers, from other people who are not product managers, but who are participating in the group activities of product management. Um, I've also heard from people, oh, this helps explain why product managers are the way they are. So if you have a product manager in your life, or if you are a product manager, I think uh, <laughs> I would recommend my own book. Well, thank you for that. I recommend it too for anyone starting out in product or experience in product. It just gives a different perspective that ties everything back into your practice. Um, again, reminding everyone to uh, engage uh, in the conversation, ask a question. So I'm going to take a question from Andrew. What's one main tool that helps you organize your processes? Um, Asana, Airtable, Jira, is there a holy grail? Oh, that's a great question. And the answer is there is no holy grail. The tools will not save you. Um, I will say from the first edition to this edition, my stance on this has actually softened a little bit where I used to be like kind of vehemently anti-tool, um, which was also overvaluing tools in a sense, right? You're giving tools too much power if you assume they'll solve problems for you, but you're also giving them too much power if you assume they will uniquely create problems for you. So my approach to tools now is that most tools are fine. Like most tools will do what you need them to do, and it's really all a question of how you use them. So my, uh, my short answer is like, there are no holy grails, but there are very few. I don't know what the opposite of a holy grail would be. Um, an unholy, an, <laughs> an unholy chalice of doom. There are no none of those either. Um, the key to any tool is how you use it. So start there, and uh, don't sweat it too much. Because again, most tools are more than capable of doing whatever you need them to do. The challenge is actually working with your team to figure out what you actually need them to do. Next question: Will there be any? new books next i hope so i have a i have a very grandiose idea for a next book and there's somebody who i really want to co-author it with who i might co-author it with and i don't want to say more than that because it's very new but um, if you want to put a little put a little positive positive energy out there into the universe for this to happen i will uh, welcome that energy because i really hope it happens and that's kind of all i'm comfortable saying at this point because I, it's I'm, I'm I'm holding the little the little wish bobble close. Well, we're wishing you and giving you positive vibes on that. I'm, I can't wait. Um, how was your experience in changing product culture in an enterprise environment where product teams are generally seen as a feature factor? That's a good question. That's, that's a great question. Um, the short answer is frustrating until I changed until I shifted the goalposts a little bit. So the challenge with that is that enterprises are really, really complex living organisms. Um, and every time I have tried to find a single leverage point and be like, we're gonna reorg or we're gonna introduce training or we're gonna do this or that, it never does what I want it to do ever. It has never been like, come in, have, you know, Find the, I, I love systems thinking and I love the like, find a point of leverage, change the system approach, but it's never done what I thought it would do on an enterprise. Um, what I found is that the most effective product managers within enterprise environments work the constraints rather than fighting the constraints. So there's a, a, a kind of metaphor I use in the book, which I've been thinking about a lot, where in, a, in an enterprise, like you're, you're in a, a container, 
right? And the shape of that container is rarely what you want it to be. And the ceiling is low and the walls are kind of cramped. And a lot of product managers, I, I know their, their impulse is to like push the walls as hard as they can. But within that constrained container, you usually have the opportunity to do something valuable for your customers, right? Your customers are on the other side of that container waiting for something. And honestly, the biggest culture change I've seen at an enterprise is when more product managers just start saying, you know what, I'm going to let the walls be what they are. I'm going to really do the best I can within these constraints to deliver value to our customers, to understand our customers. I might not be able to do as much discovery as I wanted, but I'm going to do the discovery I can. I might not be able to, you know, work exactly the way I read about in a book, but I'm going to do the things that I think are right. And slowly over time, you start to build credibility. People start to look at you and say, oh, that person's doing something really interesting. Maybe we can do that as well. So, you know, to the feature factory question specifically, yeah, almost every enterprise I've worked with, executives are saying, go build this, go build that. But the least effective product managers I work with throw their hands up and say, well, it's a feature factory. I guess I've got to do what the boss says. The most effective ones are like, okay, what do they mean by that? Let me dig in a little bit. So when they say go build a, you know, an AI driven platform, what does that mean to them? Is there still an opportunity for me to go and do some discovery and kind of thread the needle between what executives say they want and what our customers want? Um, that open and curious mindset will take you incredibly far. And I've been shocked at how many times people think they're being given an immovable list of features to build. But when they actually have a curious conversation in response, where did this come from? What's going on? Yeah, like maybe two of the things on that item were like promised in excruciating detail to an investor and need to be built. But three of those things are actually pretty flexible. And if you know what those things are, and if you know exactly what the promises are that were made and to whom and why, you buy yourself a lot more room to do interesting work. So I would say, you know, I talk about it a lot as falling in love with reality, like like fall in love with the reality of your situation, go deep into what's possible, um, stay open, stay curious, and don't waste your energy uh, trying, to, trying to push against the constraints until you've exhausted all the room you have within those constraints to, to do what's right for your users. That's a great answer and great analogy actually. Um, really love that. Um, next question. Um, new PM and the only product person in my company. So I'm doing a lot of different things. User research, design sprints, road mapping, everything basically. We're hiring our first product designer. So I'm wondering if you have any advice on how to differentiate the two roles and how to work with a designer. Yeah, I mean, I what I always tell people is like, there's always overlap and some ambiguity between these roles. Start by scoping it at the team level. Um, what does your team need? Like what are the, both what are the activities that your team needs? And like what kind of person do you think is gonna succeed on your particular team? Every team is different. Every team has different needs. You know, in, in my experience, um, there's always, again, there's always some overlap and that's okay. Um, I love that as a, as a product person, you're doing those things. Um, so I would say like, what are the things that you need on your team from a product designer in order for your team to be successful? I would ask everybody on your team that same question. What are the things you need from a product designer in order for you to be successful as a team? But I would keep the conversation 100% scope to the team level. Like what does the team need? Not like what is the differentiation in theory between these two roles? Because you might realize you need a designer who does have more like product management -y experience, or you might need a designer who's like really experienced in a certain type of visual design or a certain kind of UX design. People have such vastly varying experiences, which is part of what I love about doing cross-functional product work. Um, but that this is exactly the kind of question that I think the answer you get from me will be probably much less valuable than the answer you get from your team if you go to them and just say, what do we need to be successful? What are the, what are the activities, what are the skills? Um, and then really try to shape that role around the specific needs of your specific team. Uh, because again, different teams need such wildly different things that I always try to stop myself short of, of saying literally anything more definitive than that. 
Yeah, and you kind of discuss uh, this in your book in terms of like product owner and you know differentiating the roles, product management, and I love that advice in terms of like really finding what the company's definition is and using that. So great example here. Um, uh, next question: How would you approach changing the output mind of a stakeholder into an outcomes mindset? That's a great question. So the first thing I'm going to put out there, I've, I've been thinking about this one a lot. I don't know if you ever really change anybody's mind. People change their own minds. They make the choice to change their own minds when their context changes and when situations change. But I don't know if I've ever really changed anybody's mind about anything. Um, I think the best you can hope to do is to put somebody in a position where they are comfortable making the decision to change their own mind. And when it comes to the outcomes and output thing, um, what I usually try to do is help folks think about how they want these things to be connected. So again, there's a reason why people have output mindsets, right? It's not that they're, that they're just like bad, evil, miserable people who are trying to make your life difficult. There's something, there's some reason that that is the way they're seeing the world. And I would say like, understand that reason, especially when you're working in an organization where there might be marketing deadlines, where somebody has to do a media buy. There might be, again, promises that somebody else has made. And if you can understand what exactly those promises are and you can help someone keep those promises and help them think about the outcomes that those things will deliver, then you're putting them in a position where they can own that change, where rather than you trying to change their mind, you've shown them a better way and helped them find a better way of doing things. So I would say, you know, the way I try to think about it now is that outcomes and outputs need to be systematized, right? What do you want the relationship between those things to be? Like, how do you want them to work together? Because you still need output, right? And I found that a lot of folks who, again, for whatever reasons, really need to have clarity and specificity around output get really nervous when you start talking about outcomes over output. So what I usually do is I just say, like, help me understand, like, what are you responsible for? What's what, what are the promises you made? What's what does success look like for you? And then sit down with them and be like, cool, like, well, here's what success looks like for me, you know. Let's think about how we want these things to be connected. Like, what do we think this output is going to deliver from an outcome standpoint? What do you want it to deliver from an outcome standpoint? Um, again, really let them let them drive that change and help them see that connection. Because otherwise, again, I, I feel like every time in my life I have tried to convince somebody of anything or change somebody's mind, it has made things worse. So at this point, my approach is, is whenever I can, whenever I can calm myself and go on and say, all right, I can't control the outcome here, can't control what somebody else is going to think or how they're going to feel, but I can go in and ask a lot of questions and try to learn more about their mindset and then help connect their mindset to my mindset. That's really all you can do. Yeah, no, that's wonderful advice. Yeah, being curious. And again, I go back to your chapter. In the book, I love that chapter. Um, I just want to read a statement and then one more question. Uh, the statement is uh, somebody uh, says that they genuinely enjoyed reading your book. It was like yeah. it seemed like discussing uh, things with you over coffee. The book is like reading a Big Brother's Diary. Thanks, Matt. Ah, I'm an only child, so that's particularly special to me. Thank you for that. Uh, what's your favorite product book, except your own? <laughs> oh, there's so many good ones out there. Uh, Teresa Torres' Continuous Discovery Habits is like, I'm so excited that that, that book got published. Um, I, I always, rec like, when product teams are like, what book should we read together? I usually recommend Continuous Discovery Habits before I recommend my own book, because it's that good. Um, so Continuous Discovery Habits by Teresa Torres. Um, Escaping the Build Trap by Melissa Perry is also great. That's another one that I highly recommend. Um, I, her definition of product management as facilitating a value exchange is my favorite. I mentioned that in, in, in my book. Um, there's a lot of really good new stuff available now that was not available when the first edition came out. Um, I also really, as a lot of folks do, I recommend reading a lot of books that aren't about product management, but are about team dynamics, like all the Patrick Lencioni books, um, especially Five Dysfunctions of a Team, um there's there's a lot of a lot of great stuff out there 
Do you have time? Do we have time for one more book? I know we're. I do. I, I I I welcome all questions. I've got. I'm like I could stay here forever. I love talking about this stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, what strategies can product managers utilize in lock-in trust from a stake from stakeholders when results don't turn out as planned? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I have found that in a lot of cases, the issue, the underlying issue is that there was not clarity about what as planned means. In other words, you move forward with the assumption that things would work out a certain way and they didn't. Um, one of my favorite concepts uh, in product management right now is from my friend Adam Thomas. I cited in the book, um, you can look it up because it's so brilliant. He talks about this idea of survival metrics, which is related to the idea of a pre-mortem. Um, what you're basically doing is before you launch something, you're not just saying like, what do we hope will happen? But like, what's the, not just what's the ceiling, but what's the floor also, right? Like what's the, what does failure look like and what do we do if it fails? Um, and, and, and part of the reason I think this idea is so brilliant is that that conversation is a lot easier to have when you have it up front. Um, you never want to be in a position as a product manager where you've kind of hoped that something will work and then it doesn't work and you have to be like, eh, now what do we do? You should go in knowing what to do, knowing what you're going to pay attention to. Um, I've disappointed and frustrated so many product managers I coach when they come to me and they say, we got 50 new users. And I'm like, how many did you think you were going to get? And they're like, well, we didn't say because we didn't know. And you, you set yourself up for a really uncomfortable situation when that happens. Um, so what I would recommend in this particular situation is like, if results don't turn out as planned, own it and be like, hey, this didn't work out as planned. And I think that moving forward, let's get really disciplined about figuring out what as planned looks like. Don't wait to see if there's a conversation you're afraid of, have the conversation before someone else has it at you. Um, I'm going to say that one more time because I think it's so important. If there's a conversation you're afraid of having, have it before someone else has it at you. Start the conversation. If you're worried about this, if you're worried that stakeholders are going to be mad at you, call a meeting of those stakeholders and say, hey, this didn't go according to plan. Here's what we think went wrong. Here's what we're going to do differently next time. We need your help and support to make this happen. So any conversation that, that you feel is like hanging over you, uh, grab it, bring it down, make it happen, and it will work out better for you nearly every time. Nice. Very good advice. Um, well, another question just popped up. What are the main qualities you look for when you hire head of product? That's a great question. And again, it all depends on the company. Um, th there's, th it's really hard for me to answer that question because different companies need different things for head of product. Also heads of product, you know, I've, I've just learned recently in the US, a head of product is more like a CPO. In the UK, a head of product is more like somebody between a manager and a director. Um, or between a group product manager and a director. I'll say the one thing I always look for in every interview at every level is can people adapt without getting defensive? Um, when we're walking through product scenarios, I love throwing, as you said, end of the video, this, I love throwing curveballs at people, right? And to me, the biggest tell as to whether somebody's going to be somebody I want to work with is whether they fight the curveball or whether they roll with the curveball, right? They're like, well, no, 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 or like they, they start to get defensive and dig in or if they go awesome like cool new information tell me more what about this like in the real world practice of product management your ability to go through your daily work without getting defensive is probably the single most most important factor i've seen ranging from associate product managers to cpos if you can do that if someone can throw new information at you and you don't get defensive and you're just like okay awesome cool let's figure this out together um then I really think there are no limits to what you can do in this product world because it's not just you, right? It's everyone you talk to. Everyone on your team is making your practice stronger. Whereas if you dig in and get defensive, then everyone on your team is making you less effective and you're making them less effective. So that's the one thing I look for all the time. And, you know, from company to company, like sometimes I'm looking for somebody who's going to be more of a people manager. Sometimes I'm looking for somebody who's going to be better at setting product direction it all it all depends and i always start by just asking like what is the shape of person who is needed in this uh particular role at this particular company 
Yeah, and I want to end on this note because we're a little bit over time. I asked you a question before we even started the 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 live and you interviewed a lot of musicians before you even got into product management. And I asked you what was the most um, most memorable interview that, that you had from a musician. And then you told me the answer and I was like, wow, you were a product manager even before you were a product oh. manager with your response. And I definitely want people to understand what you were doing because I yes. really feel like that skill is needed in, uh, as a product manager. So I'll ask you this again live. Um, what is the most memorable interview you had uh, when you were starting out in your uh, early career interviewing musicians? Sure. So I'd say the most memorable one I had was with Stephen Merritt of the Magnetic Fields, who was a notoriously prickly interview subject. Um, if you ask him a question he doesn't like, he will go silent for a very long time and tell you exactly what is wrong with your question. Um, I was prepared for this. I was very nervous and I actually made a flow chart where I was like, here's the question. Here's what to do if he, here's like the follow up. If there's silence, here's what to do if it gets combative. I was very, very prepared for that interview. And I am still proud of the fact that that interview is one of the only interviews with that musician that has run as an unedited Q&A because it actually had a flow to it. So uh, preparation pays off, I guess. Yeah, and basically everything that you said earlier, like n knowing your bottom and knowing your top and preparing for everything, that's a, a wonderful skill to have. Uh, we did one more popped uh, one more question popped up as a newly junior PM how to learn from team senior members without dealing with scratching back requests yeah um, my favorite sentence in product management is I'm curious to learn more about the work you do um, you know it's it's a universal truth that you're better off getting to know people before you need something from them before you have those scratching back requests. And I think I found, you know, it, it's hard for me. I'm, I'm a pretty introverted person and I'm always worried before I reach out to somebody that they're like, why are you reaching out to me? What do you want from me? And sometimes they are, but usually they're not. And I've just found that it's, you learn so much from people when you're just like, I'm really curious to learn more about the work you do. Like if, you know, for example, when senior team members are like, here's the roadmap, go ask. I'm like, cool. Could you just like, could I have a half hour on your calendar if you just show me how you put this together? Um, you're going to have such a higher quality conversation than if you do what I used to do, which is to be like, either, okay, sure. Or like, well, what about, um, I'm not like to ask really specific, like the negative questions about like on the third page of the roadmap, you say this thing, but it isn't really this other, like those are not high quality conversations, but I found that just having that open and curious, like, can you show me how you did this? Can you walk me through this? Um, can you just tell me more about what you're working on? Um, those are really disarming questions and you'll learn a lot about people. Um, you will learn a lot about people and a lot from people when you just ask them with no ulterior motives, with no transactional underpinnings, just to be like, show me how you did this or like, show me how you do the work you do. Um, that's, that's how I like to approach things. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Um, and for those who haven't gotten the book already, I really, really recommend it. it definitely puts things into perspective. Um, and if you are a product manager, it definitely gives you uh, things that you never thought that you would experience and ways to help out with that. So thank you so much, Matt, for your time. Uh, appreciate it. Yeah, and thanks uh, to those who are joining live. Um, I will contact those who ask questions. So look for a message from me. Thank you again, Matt. Thank you so much. Take care, Hannah. You too. Thanks. Bye, everyone.